Good evening. Thank you very much for coming and um, welcome to the conversation with the lovely title Black Data, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? with Adam Pendleton. My name is Jenny Schlenska. I'm the Associate Curator at MoMA PS1. And I'm delighted to introduce Adam Pendleton, who was born in 1984. And his art practice moves very fluidly between painting, uh, video, collages, performance, spoken word, and many more media. Um, I first came across Adam's work in 2007 when I saw his performance, The Revival, that he did for Performer, which was an um, enchanting experience. Uh, it was a gospel concert uh, with quotes from queer experimental poetry and other experimental language uh, set in a, a minimalist stage setting, which is a, the mix of different quotations is something that we'll be talking about and is very typical for your work. Um, I also, after that, I've been following his work and um, Adam's concept of black data has be proven to be an endlessly giving and productive way of thinking about contemporary art making, but also identity history, language, and I would say even of thinking or living one's life or how we want to live our life. Um, because we're a little formal, I will also talk about where he's shown. Just recently, he was part of La Triennale at Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Before that, he had uh, works in ecstatic alphabets, heaps of language at MoMA, curated by Laura Hopman. He was in the group show Greater New York at MoMA PS1 and the generational Younger Than Jesus New Museum in 2010. He was at Manifesta 7 and many other shows all over the world. And um, I've been very lucky to have have been having a lot of conversations with Adam and I'm excited to have one uh, in public with you tonight. And I thought maybe we start with the foundations or the basics, Black Data. Uh, you wrote a manifesto in 2008 yes. called the Black Data Manifesto. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about that idea or start. Sure. So I'll. I guess I'll begin by just sort of broadly touching on this idea of black data, which is essentially an idea expressed, expressed through questions. Um, the only, usually when I'm asked what is black data, I kind of have a simple functioning definition that uh, I use, and it is, it's a way to talk about the future while talking about the past, mm -hmm. um, which means many different things, obviously. Um, but I think on the face, of, of it, it, and very literally, it's sort of joining two different ideas, this idea of black and this idea of data, and black functioning more or less as a kind of open-ended signifier, and data perhaps, you know, pointing towards, you know, the avant-garde art movement. Um, you know, it's funny when uh, I came across, you know, the word, you know, you come across data through an art context and you come across the word black, you know, through a more of a cultural context, but also through art, the color black, the idea of black, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I was uh, listening um, as I was getting ready and thinking about this talk to uh, Amiri Baraka's reading of his poem, Black Data Nihilismus, which is sort of also foundational to this, I that text is foundational to this idea of black data. And when he was giving the reading, he said to the audience, you know, this, the name of this poem is Black Dada Nihilismus. And he said to the audience, well, we all know what black is, and everybody laughs. And he says, and Dada is, you know, a concept in art that was geared towards getting, to people, getting people to look at things differently. 
And I sort of paused and I you know, thought it was amusing how everyone laughed when he said, oh, we all know what black is, you know, but uh, we don't. You know, it's a complicating position. It's a capacious space. It's um, about multiplicity, about moving in many different directions at once. Um, and I like this idea of duplicity, you know, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two souls, et cetera, et cetera, coming together to form one. Um, but even when something, you know, that is a part comes together, um, it, it, it still is a, a fractured and complex space. So that is what Black Dada, a part, and a part of what Black Data is, it's something, uh, it's about multiplicity. It moves in many different directions at once. Think, thinking about your work, um, what all the works and all these different medias, you put them out. I forgot to say you publish, for example, yeah. too. Um, and I'm sure if I think about it, m much more comes to mind. But what they all have together is that you use things that are already exist. You use language yes. that already exists. You use images that already exist. You did use sound that already exists. But I also just you talking about the doubleness. Um, another trace or characteristics of your work that I'm very drawn to is this mixing of two things or maybe even three things that not, not necessarily belong together or yeah. we think of not belonging together. I mean, Black Dada in itself, you said, said that Black Dada Nihilismus is a, is a poem of Leroy Jones, who later became Amiri Baraka yes. from 1964. And then Dada Manifesto is the Hugo Ball Manifesto from 1916. 16, so yes. these two things, they don't belong together. I'm thinking of revival, the performance that I already talked about. You bring gospel and minimalism together yes. and then you create this really productive space. I wouldn't even say you, you produce something third. It's not a dialectic uh, relationship, you know, but I you create a space. I think very much so for me, it's a question of how to make things new. You mm -hmm. know, so y when you think of using things that already exist, it's one could presume these are things that people are familiar with, images that, you know, have a familiar quality to them. And I think what I'm asking myself is how to sort of gear people's attention to something so that instead of language being something that is a fleeting moment, but it's something that becomes concrete and vital. So we listen to the word, not just what it means, but how it sounds, how it is shaped, what it looks like, you know. So I often think that using existing material and, and putting it in relationship to something that it's not all normally in relationship to is a way to really shift what I would call sort of the geometry of attention, if you will. You know, so you're sort of looking at things from um, multiple viewpoints and not just in a, in a linear fashion, but sort of as you're speaking about how a lot of the texts that inform my practice are, you know, you'll go from 1964 to 1916 to 1903. And it, I really don't even look at them in a kind of chronological order. Rather, they sort of move fluidly. You know, something from 1916, in my mind, might actually be the thing that influences the thing from 1903. Um, and I, ultimately, I think that speaks to a present, an idea of our present moment, a kind of um, a notion of time that is, is very much so focused on you know, how we're moving through, through things now, which is, in my opinion, a past and a future dynamic. Uh, which brings me to another important aspect of your work is the notion of history yes. or the notion of time. You already mentioned the sentence in the Black Data Manifesto that I always find helpful you know, repeating it um, t if, I, if I confront your work that Black Data is a way about talking about the future by talking about the fast, past <laughs> and we are in what does it say? And, and the moment it's of its the coming into being. Of its coming yes. into being. So the notion of history or time is a very peculiar one. Mm. Um, could you talk about that? I mean, it's the opposite of a, of a historian looking at the past. Well, I like this idea that things are perpetually becoming. You know, that nothing is is static and fixed. You know. 
um, but that our relationship to things, for example, is always changing. Uh, so in a way, things uh, sort of never become quite grounded, but in the, at the same time, they become incredibly concrete, you know. Um, for example, the way I use words and sort of erasing language will take, you know, let's say you take a word like data and you end up representing it with a, just the D, you know. So you have the thing itself and you have the idea of the thing itself as well, you know. So uh, I think that creates a, a kind of a fluid environment, um, if you will. Uh, I love this uh, statement that um, Deleuze said that it's not just an image or, you know, excuse me, it is just an image, it's just an idea. It's not about the right thing for, you know, that confirms sort of dominant ideas, but it's really just about offering something um, that can kind of disrupt space. Does that answer your question, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, maybe we could talk more about the disrupting of space. Yeah. Because there's also, even though it's so open and multiplying and, and travels in many directions, the idea of black data, it's also a strategy. It is a strategy, for sure. Um, it, uh, parts of it are irrational, for example, um, but it's also very much so about creating a, what I would call a site of engagement, um, a place where while we are looking, we are also being looked at. Um, so sort of being very conscious of how we're interacting with, let's say, an object. Uh, a lot of my work uses mirrors, for example, uh, so which very purposefully grounds the person and their experience of the work. So, it, you know, the object on the wall is not just the object of the, on the wall, but it's your reflection of yourself as you look at the object on the wall, um, which I think creates a very different kind of situation, you know. Um, the image becomes disrupted, um, your sense of yourself becomes disrupted, uh, so, yeah. And um, how about the, the idea of history when you say we're talking about the future while talking about the past, that becomes a very creative act like the history becomes malleable? Like, is that something you're interested in? Like, Well, I think there are certain dominant narratives that I think we assume are very, that, you know, sort of, um, in a way, police how we think about time and how things have occurred and how they do occur. And I th am very much so suggesting that things happen in real time that again, that many things are happening at once. So it's, um, it's, so it's a way of creating a, a new narrative that speaks to um, different notions of, you know, this happened and that, and then that happened, you know. Um, but you know, mostly when I think about history and time, I'm actually thinking about it in a linguistic space. And a lot mm -hmm. of the writers I'm interested in are always talking about in their writing, trying to create a present moment through the text. And I think what they mean when they say that is they mean how they're turning your attention to the language itself. They're turning you away from, let's say, the idea of a grand narrative that Susie, you know, bounced a ball and went to the grocery store. But rather, they want you to think about each word. So when you look at the work of, you know, someone like Gertrude Stein, the language is often very repetitive, you know. So she'll start with a very simple idea, like, he told me. He told me, then he told me, he told me again, and then he told me, you know. So that very simple statement moves beyond, you know, that simple experience of he told me, and you start to think about, you know, the word individually, he told me, and then all of the ways that that could be said, for example. So in, instead of you focusing on the idea of a grand structure, you know, you're sort of looking at the individual parts of something, and you're realizing how those things come together, you know? Um, instead of, this, I hope that mm -hmm. makes some kind of, yeah, some kind of sense. And maybe we should talk about language, your interest. You have a deep interest in language and poetry yes. and experimental language. 
and you use it, I don't know how much familiar the audience is with your work, but you use language, letters, figuratively as a form, mm -hmm. and you use it literally as um, an, a, a source of information. Mm. And um, But could you talk about how how your interest in these experimental languages, Gertrude Stein, you m already mentioned, uh, there's Ron Silliman, who you're very interested in, um, other Dada was also, like Hugo Ball was yeah. writing poetry, um, how these language experiments, how they're part of the bigger Black Dada project. Well, I think what's uh, very important when you're dealing with any kind of concept or idea is to d also develop a language um, that is different, that is new. Uh, I love, you know, Hugo Ball says that he doesn't want to use the words in, you know, invented by other people. He wants his own stuff, his own vowels, his, o his own consonants, for example. Um, and I very much so relate to that. And, you know, in Hugo Ball's Dada Manifesto, you know, he's sort of using very normative language, saying, you know, language can be this, and you poets, you never really use language. You're always writing about the, you're, uh, who are always writing with words, but never the word itself, for example. And then he sort of goes, da, 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 im, da, da, di, da, da, di, di, da, 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 you know, and it's kind of this nonsense, you know. Uh, but it, it's funny because it's the first time, it, you, for example, when you read that manifesto, you're kind of like, oh, I understand what he means, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And he was specifically talking about his own sound poetry, you know, mm -hmm. and how the sound poetry was going to get people to focus on words, you know? And you mentioned Ron Silliman, who wrote a, um, a very seminal text called uh, The New Sentence. And Gertrude Stein has this great quote where she says, sentences are uh, not emotional, paragraphs are. So I think, sort of going back to what I said, that you know, I th what all of these guys are saying is, is when we stop looking at a kind of a grand structure, a grand nar narrative, and we start to, start to look at the individual parts, our experience becomes very different. It becomes very concrete, very real, very tangible, it's something that can change things, it's something that can shape our experience, you know? It can cause a revolution, I think some of them would go that far. Uh, Joan Ritalik, when she writes about uh, Gertrude Stein, for example, says that uh, Stein presented a linguistic revolution, and I would agree with that. Um, so in my work, you're often, I'm not usually dealing with sentences in the Black Dada Manifesto. It's very much so think, thinking about Silliman's idea of the new sen sentence and the syllog syllogistic movement between one sentence and the next sentence, for example. Um, Could you maybe elaborate? I don't know yes, how many people know about the new sentence. Yes, because a lot of people may not sentence. know. Yeah. Um, but the general idea would be is that instead of writing uh, one sentence, and then another sentence that's moving in a very specific direction, uh, you're sort of letting the sentence exist as a complete thing. The sentence itself is the experience. So you could have a sentence like, um, I'll use a, one of his sentences, but he'll say, the function of language is to express the world. I open the newspaper. Um, or he'll say, Angela Davis has no private moments. And so these sentences are not, you know, sort of a one-to-one -one relationship. They're, you know, sort like of... Like a normal language, we try to a make normal sense. Thing. Basically how we're talking. We're desperately sense. trying to make sense to you right now. <laughs> And I'm probably using, a lot, to you guys, a lot of new sentences that not making so much sense, but that's okay. But, uh, so, yes, the, the idea is, is that the sentence is the complete experience. You know, he's not trying to make a paragraph. He's not trying to tell a story. Um, he's just using language. He's thinking about language as a material thing and the same way that, um, you know, let's say an abstract painter would think of a line as a sort of, you know, a kind of visual syntax, if you will. Um, the sentence is enough. But for me, I think I've taken it a step further, and in the work, you'll often end up with just one letter. So I'm not even saying that the sentence is enough. I'm saying sort of uh, the, a vanishing trace of language is enough, that this in itself is a kind of um, linguistic experience. Well, basically, it's, 
it's going in, going into the language is going into the matrix, right? I mean, Wittgenstein in one um, Adam made this great um, reader, black data reader, with all the texts that he finds uh, useful um, for talking or thinking about his work. And there, he does the same technique. He br you put in texts there from 1913, 1916, 2008, and they're all mixed um, together. But like playing with the language or trying really to change the language, uh, Wittgenstein says in here, like imagining a new language is imagining mm. a new world. Yes, I so love that. So you talk very yeah, quote, abstractly, yeah. but it is, I don't know if I would call it political. You like the word poetical? I, uh, yeah, I relate to the word um, poet poetical, but I, I do think that the way in which language is used is, is about how we occupy a political position. Um, all, another text in the Black Daughter Reader is nobody means, more, nobody means more than me to you and the future life of Willie Jordan. And it's um, a text by a poet who's now deceased by the name of June Jordan and she's talking about black English and how a lot of African Americans use a kind of linguistic buffalo, that's how she refers to it. Meaning it's not a language that is accepted, you know, why it's not widely accepted. It's kind of a niche language used in very specific communities and when it moves out of that space, you know, people, it's disruptive, you know, it's not something that people are used to, they don't understand it. Um, and so, I, I think that language is, it gives us permission to certain spaces, you, for example. Um, and, and just for example, in the way I'm communicating with you, we're using a very specific kind of language. If I was up here using black English, you know, for example, um, it would be sort of uh, disruptive, uh, which is also very productive. Or but if it, I was. Or if you were, then it would really be <laughs> disturbing. <No. laughs> But, um, but it, it is fascinating yeah. how, um, you know, language always, you know, sort of uh, shapes our experience of the world. Um, and it gives us permission to different spaces. Um, and in the text, in the Black Daughter Reader, and what I'm always thinking about the work is, yes, language and, you know, sentences and paragraphs and how these, the syntax and how things are constructed, but also the different kinds of languages that people use. Uh, for example, when you read a Godard, uh, Deleuze writing about Godard, it's a very specific kind of language. Uh, but then when you read, uh, let's say, June Jordan writing about, you know, a linguist, black English as a linguistic buffalo, it's a different use of language. So I think the more experiences we bring to the table and the more, the, the more attuned we become to how language is shaping our experience of the world. Um, and our experience of the world is, you know, sort of, it, it is, you know, it's a political reality it, it, and it can be and is a political position. What most of the poets, writers, thinkers have in common that you refer to is for one, these, the strategy of bringing things, a doubleness, or bringing things together that maybe don't belong together necessarily. And then there's this fascination with, um, Deleuze talks about stammering. Yeah. Uh, Joan Ritalik talks about silence. Yes. Uh, Dada is all about being absorbed and uh, unintel being unintelligible. What's the fascination with not making sense? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm attempting to um, av avoid an easy read, you know? Um, I think what I don't want to happen, honestly, is for people to say the work is, you know, Adam's work is, or Adam's work does. Um, but I think uh, also sort of going back to Deleuze, I'm sort of interested in the conjunction of end. You know, it does this end, it does that. Instead of, you know, the sky is blue or God is, you know, you're rather saying it is this end, it is that. Um, but I also like what uh, Gertrude Stein says that uh, to enjoy is to understand, mm -hmm. you know. 
Um, and I, of course, hope I'm creating, you know, a kind of experience and objects um, and whatnot yeah. that people can enjoy. And for me, that Which is they understanding. Which always are. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are. Yeah. I mean. So there's something um, very real and true about that statement, to enjoy is to understand. And I think that's uh, something that people have to get used to, that when you see something that it's okay to express yourself through questions, you know, you don't have to, it's, you know, the thing doesn't have to be expressed through answers. You mm -hmm. don't have to have answers about what you're looking at. You just have to be open to the experience it's offering. And maybe to make it all a little more concrete and ap um, graspable, I thought maybe we end with talking about process. Sure. Like how you actually um, make your works. Um, I've been to your studio and I was thinking today what actually, what are actually his tools, his language and they're all his black daughters and the ideas. And I think the only tool that I can think of in your studio is your Xerox machine. I have a copy machine. <laughs> it's, the go it's the queen of the studio. Um, be, and also books and you right. know I always have these stacks of books that I'm perpetually making in my studio um, and it, it's really just a very simple act of you know sort of creating these kind of uh, my own sort of narratives um, and I, you know books obviously this have is all like yeah and this is um, this is how do you make these how do I make that yeah that because this is a similar technique how you make the black data paintings yeah, well, with these the, foils and Yeah, layers. and the fact that, that, that everything is um, Xerox, which is mm -hmm. a way for me of archiving something. Um, but it's also a, a sort of a process of removing images from, you know, if it's in a book, the Xerox kind of creates a different kind of situation. It just creates a page. Um, so for me, it, it feels as though it's something that uh, can be man manipulated more easily, for example. Um, so all of the, anything that anyone looks at that is, you know, sort of on the wall is based on a, um, a Xerox of something from a book, yeah. Uh, so that's how things begin. They begin with uh, Xerox, the Xerox, yeah. yeah. And then the Black Data paintings? Well, they go from the Xerox to sort of being blown up. I guess a, a, a photographic process of making a silkscreen, basically. Um, which is a giant silk screen, which is just sort of a mechanical way of applying ink to a surface. Um, but don't you also first put them on foils and move the elements? Yes, around? to make the silk screen screen, you have mm -hmm. to create the film, and mm -hmm. so the film is uh, this clear sort of transparency. Yeah. And it, there's always one piece of the solid unfinished. Cute. Well, the the black dot of pain. You have rules. I right? do have rules. Yes. yes. Tell us about the rules. Well, surprising. It might <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I it's I'm a very very structured um, person. In and the I, nonsense. Yes. Yeah. The, the <laughs> I structure the nonsense, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so all of the work. Uh, basically has a has sort of its own syntax there a, a, a visual rules if you will um, and sort of determining the scale of the, the, the letters and sort of how the words are positioned so nothing is sort of seemingly random so I'm looking at rules in other words as opportunity um, instead of something that's sort of limiting limiting the realm of possibilities I think it expands them um, because again, sort of how it shifts your mind and shifts your geometry of tension. You're sort of looking at a situation and thinking, well, what can I do if I move it here, if I move it here? But you have sort of a, a set, you know, set of um, principles or rules that you can uh, use to, to go about that. And I think a lot of people don't see that when they look at the work until it's explained to them. I think they'll see that, oh, in a black dot of painting, the letters are always, you know, on, you know, facing this way and they're never upside mm -hmm. down, for example. Um, so these are sort of my visual rules. Um, and I think that's a, really a way of sort of me sort of looking at how language has rules and then how something that's uh, purely visual can also have rules in its own sort of system of order. And um, the performances, like the revival, what was 
the process for that? Well, the performances <laughs> actually have no rules. <laughs> well, they do actually, they do. Um, but uh, the revival was very much so me just sort of uh, putting into, you know, real time these ideas that I had about um, language and history and sort of uh, just creating a, a performance oriented space to ask these questions. You know, what would happen if you uh, paired a Larry Kramer speech about the tragedy of today's gays with gospel music, you know? Gays and gospels don't usually, you know, gay and gospel don't usually, you know, go together so well. Um, so actually, a moment in the revival, for example, um, these two singers are singing this uh, gospel song about after a while, about how God will save you, and all of this kind of uh, stuff. And I'm not a religious person, just so people, <laughs> people for the know. record. For the record. And anyway, so the, the choir is singing this gospel song, you know, after a while, after a while, this shoot too shall pass after a while. And I layer on top of that excerpts from uh, the Larry Kramer speech, uh, which I was interested in because it has, he's sort of very critical of the position that uh, gays or homosexuals are occupy, you know, sort of occupying in America at a critical moment. In other words, when George Bush has been elected for a second time, instead of people sort of taking to the street and thinking about their body politic and you know what it means to be a citizen, uh, you know, actually, you know, AIDS is on the rise and the spread of STDs and all of this kind of stuff. So he's very critical of his own community and sort of saying, "What are you doing? Wake up!" You know. And I think that's sort of language that you go, okay, Larry, we get what you're saying. But I think when you have sort of this gospel song, you know, sort of playing in the background, you sort of really start to mm -hmm. hear what Larry is saying, you know, and it, 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 it complicates things and in, a, in a very productive way. And the music? Productive problem. Music. Yeah. I know that you, I don't know how much you want to talk about it, but you working on a new performance piece mm -hmm. and you th thinking about really writing the music for revival you d did not no all of the all of the music for the revival was sort of existing music um, I mean the my performances are language based and I essentially use uh, music as a way of mm -hmm. structuring the language um, so that uh, you know, words have one tone, and music is a is a very different kind of tonal experience. Um, and I'm interested in the relationship between those two. You know, talking can be sort of boring, but talking, music, and talking is very different. It's like a movie. It changes. Yeah, it mm -hmm. changes things. You know, a love scene with mm -hmm. no music is very different than a love scene yeah. with music. It can be um, almost so, painful. Yeah. So I'm, you know, music, that, that yeah. kind of cinematic yeah. expression. I always yeah. think the performances are cinematic in a kind of a way and how they sort of um, manipulate sort of space, you know, language and music and time and whatnot. Okay, I'm, I think we're almost done. Do you, should we open up to the audience or? Yes. People have questions. Um, I have a question. I imagine that you have been um, very comfortable using the words in your own language, right? I don't know how many languages you, you speak, but what about um, have you been ever having those exploration with other languages? If it's yes, what is the sensation that I imagine that is different that to play or to develop your hour with your own language? If is that the case, you already did it, you will, you are thinking to do. And how do you feel when you have to use the same elements to express similar ideas to be global uh, have you ever thinking to use another language that you are familiar or some of your friends with? Thank you. Sure. Well, I I barely speak English one, so <laughs> <laughs> I struggle. No, <laughs> but uh, I think um, 
I think I do not speak other lang any another language fluently to answer that question. Um, but I, I imagine, of course, you know how translating something, you know, comparative literature, et cetera, et cetera, you, you realize the different nuances between, you know, German and English and whatnot. Um, but I think more broadly speaking, I'm interested in making all language foreign, if you will. Um, so, um, yeah, if that makes sense. Well, and just you're interested in making the language feel strange. No? Yeah. The strangeness, like feeling strange in your own language. Yeah. Um, well, th just this idea that uh, the language we experience, I hope the language that, that mm, people yeah. experience in my work does not feel like the language you experience in, in, ev in everyday situations, that it, it is a foreign experience. It is other, you know, it, it points towards something else. Um, yeah, a foreign language, if you will. Um, so I guess I want to ask maybe a, a simple question, but that hopefully opens out onto something more complicated. And that is, I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about what I think of as the, the affective or emotional quality mm. of your work. Because it seems to me that structurally, something really fundamental that you do is always, um, and regardless of medium, whether it's a, a video or a painting or a performance, uh, you're bringing together kind of affectively incompatible elements, like really emotionally hot and emotionally cool things, uh, like say in, in the Black Dada paintings where we have you know, this really intense piece of poetry brought up against you know, one of the most abstruse experiments of you know, minimal conceptual art and then realized in this, you know, silkscreen medium that is itself kind of distanced. Um, and I think that's something very typical mm. for you. And I'm wondering, you know, what, what, what's the particular valence or experience for you of those two elements coming together, kind of clashing? Thanks. Mm. Well, Tom, I guess I was, I was one thing that I could speak about is sort of um, thinking about the politics of joy um, and also sort of uh, uh, the idea of a, trans a transcendental moment, if you will, um, being something that, and this is one of the things that the revival looked very closely at, uh, was this idea that the avant-garde is not about the body, it's about ideas, for example. And what I mean by that is that, for example, when we listen to gospel music, it's this very emotive space, you know, where people are putting their arms up, perhaps, people are crying, you know, saying yes, yes. And then we come over here and, you know, now we're looking at conceptual art, you know, and it's sort of drier and, you know, people are not throwing their arms up. <laughs> or maybe they do, you know, sometimes they do, but for different reasons. Um, and I guess, Maybe it's, it's, it's an impossibility, um, but I would love to sort of create that moment where those two different things come together where perhaps when you're looking at the painting, it's, it's similar to listening to a gospel song. Um, I'm always very interested, for example, in how Gertrude Stein's uh, writing relates to gospel music. Um, where you sort of have in gospel music this repetitive use of language like yes Lord, yes Lord, amen, you know the same lyrics over and over and over again, you know until you get in kind of this cathartic state, you know where you're kind of letting things go. Um, but there is also a kind of um, uh, 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 sort of removed quality to my work, um, but again there there are these very sensual moments, you know, and sort of how the paint is applied to the, the, the canvas. Everything is very careful. Everything is very, very, you know, sort of uh, perfect, if you will. Um, and I think there's something emotive about that, you know, sort of as that, that question, how did this happen? How did this occur? Um, so it's sort of asking people to move inward, you know, sort of how you would if you were listening to a piece of music, if you will. So it's sort of um, how a detail can be sort of as emotive as anything else. Does that answer your question?
Okay. A little over time, but not too much, I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Adam. Thank you so much.